Hello, everybody. Uh, this is Dr. Reynolds, and welcome to the Chapter 2 lecture, The Study of Intercultural Communication. This chapter is really about setting up the framework through which we'll, we will conduct our study of intercultural communication this semester through this textbook. Uh, so learning objectives very quickly. We can identify four early foci of uh, the development of intercultural communication. Describe three approaches, contemporary approaches to the study of intercultural communication. Identify the methods used within, within each of the three. Explain both the street strengths and weaknesses of each approach. Identify three characteristics of the dialectical approach, which is the approach we're adopting in this class. Explain the strengths of a dialectical approach. And identify six intercultural communication dialectics. Um, so we'll talk about what that means, of course, in this lecture. So here we go. Just really quickly, intercultural communication, what is it? Well, it's studied worldwide by scholars in many different disciplines with different worldviews, that is research philosophies, and using different methodologies. But it's interested in looking at communication between and among different cultures. So early on, uh, as an academic discipline, uh, intercultural communication became uh, necessary in the post-World War II era, when the United States increasingly came to dominate the world stage. Um, but in a, in a broader worldview, it is also when, because of the world wars and because of gains in technology, um, communication between cultures became much more normal and necessary for uh, working together as humans. Um, so obviously in the war we had, uh, we're sending soldiers and support staff all over the world, not only in Europe where other wars like World War I had involved people, but also uh, to parts of Asia um, and the South Pacific and Northern Africa. Uh, and the government uh, realized that there were challenges to working with other people of other cultures that they had not anticipated based on previous experience. So the U.S. government in 1946 passed the Foreign Service Act to establish the Foreign Service Institute in order to study and develop ways in which to prepare Americans who were going to work abroad to do their work. Um, so they were called these pre-departure, or right before they leave courses, that eventually came to be the foundation for what now is known as kind of cross-cultural training and diversity training that people might get when they work for a company, of course, when they also work uh, in the foreign service or in the military and will be stationed other places, right? Um, Dream of Moon made a really uh, significant observation that has defined the ways in which the discipline has grown over the past decade or so, noting that culture is defined, how culture is defined determines how it is studied. Um, in other words, that the way we think about culture is gonna determine our methodology for studying culture. In arguing for the notion of culture to include the study of power and to expand the definition to include ethnicity, race, gender, and all these other markers we talked about in our first lecture. Okay, so um, rather than just thinking about kind of different countries as these monocultures and how we can think about a, a country's culture as one thing, that there are aspects of different uh, groups of people and individuals within those countries that might uh, have significantly different culture based on these other identity markers. Okay, so um, that matters, and we'll talk about why that matters as we walk through. Here we go. Um, early interdisciplinary contribution. So one aspect of the approach we're taking is, is it is interdisciplinary, that it is intentionally pulling from different disciplines to take a combined approach towards the study. And this is something that has been seen as valuable, right? The value in diversity of perspectives, um, even in this these early efforts. So. The FSI came from various disciplines, including linguistics, anthropology, and psychology. Linguistics, the study of language, anthropology, the study of human cultures, and psychology, the study of the human mind, right? So um, in this way, 
We are looking at language as a phenomenon, as culture as a phenomenon, and as the individual as a phenomenon that all had some role to play in communication and how we understand human communication. Uh, linguists also pointed out that by learning other languages, we can come to understand other cultures, creating what they call intercultural competence, that is, uh, knowledge about other people's culture. That is because language carries culture, um, just like other aspects of culture are carried in other productions, right? Um, anthropologists uh, were interested not only in the role of language, but also in the role of nonverbal communication. So they bring a different perspective to this study. Um, and psychologists then uh, take these notions of stereotyping and prejudice and try to see how our individual prejudices and our use of stereotypes our impact, our intercultural awareness and competence, and our ability to communicate effectively. So an interdisciplinary focus can help people acquire and interpret information in a more comp comprehensive manner, right? Looking at it from different perspectives to get a more complete picture, right? So not just language, not just non-cultural communication, not just kind of our internal psychology that drives how we understand the world around us, right? But all of those perspectives kind of working together to give us a fuller picture. Um, there's also the idea that, of course, the way we understand culture, what culture is, what we think culture should be, defines our understanding of the world around us and how that worldview determines how we work as researchers. Okay, so we call that perspective a research paradigm or the worldview of the scholar. Um, so people understand and learn about the world through filtering lenses. They select, evaluate, and organize information from external environment through perception. All of the information people have already stored in their brains, the things we've learned, right, affect how we interpret new information. So there are group-related perceptions, right, based on our own experience of who we are and how we see ourselves as insiders and outsiders of different groups that are part of our worldviews that come with value orientations. That is what we talked about in the first chapter, what we think things should or should not be, what people should or should not do, should or should not think or say, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and oftentimes these are uncritical. That is, we don't question them. We just accept them and they are just part of how we understand the world. Academic research itself can have its own cultural behavior because research traditions drive our own, what we learn about what we should or should not do when we study things, right? So uh, one good example of this is that Asian scholars often point out that U.S. communication scholars emphasize individuality, individuality and rationality which are two strong cultural beliefs held by many U.S. Americans, right? Um, and ignore things like human in interdependence and feeling in human encounters, which are important beliefs for many other people around the world. So these, sometimes these kind of underlying cultural values that we don't think about, right? How individualism is central to be what it is to be American, perhaps. Um, become part of our worldview that impact the way we understand and study other cultures. We can see this in intercultural conflicts in which scholars disagree. I like the example of Galileo being excommunicated from the Catholic Church because he took issue with the theologian's belief that the earth was the center of the universe. Um, and then, right, that's a, that kind of an extreme example, but it shows there's a history to this kind of conflict, right? Um, but that more recently, right, communication scholars might believe there's an external reality that can be measured, whereas linguists, uh, and we'll talk about interpretive models, understand reality as something that can only be lived and understood and experienced. And so these very different kind of scholarly perspectives can impact how we study the phenomena around us. Um, so three approaches that we're working from in uh, Developing our own perspective are the social science or functionalist approach, the interpretive approach, and the critical approach. These approaches are based on different fundamental assumptions about human nature, human behavior, and the nature of knowledge that we'll talk about briefly. And they vary in their assumptions about kind of what how humans act, 
what we're trying to learn about humans and about intercultural communication and how we understand culture and communication and finally how we actually understand that our methodologies so it's important to un to understand the assumptions behind the scholarship so we can talk about what are the strengths of those approaches and what are the weaknesses of those approaches and how is the work that we're going to do in this class going to kind of maximize those strengths and minimize those weaknesses okay so we're going to start with the social science approach the social science approach or also called the functionalist approach is based on research in psychology and sociology uh, the approach assumes a describable external reality and assumes that human behavior is predictable and the researcher's goal is to describe and predict behavior so um, pay attention to a couple of those ideas there right the idea that there's an external reality that can be described right so this is a scientific approach right um, and assumes that human behavioral right that's the social right we're focused on humans is that social so social sciences then um, but this idea that if we study something because uh, phenomena repeat and are external to us uh, we should be able to build models to predict things um, so the idea is not only to describe but also be able to eventually model and predict behavior okay researchers who take this approach often use quantitative methods gathering data by administering questionnaires or observing subjects firsthand right this scientific approach um, social science research has assumed that culture is a variable that can be measured so when we talk about how science works what you're trying to do is replicate a study over and over again just changing and measuring one variable right so the idea um, of social science research is that culture is one of those variables that you could um, adjust and uh, describe how changing that variable um, changes the results of the study and then build models to account for that changing variable many social science studies explain how communication styles vary from culture to culture often based on individualistic versus collectivist values so individualistic is that psychology perspective psychology is very interested in the individual mind how the individual interacts how things are idiosyncratic that is they are unique to the individual uh, versus collectivist that's the um, sociology perspective right that, that societies operate in particular ways right so social science studies can do one or both of those things depending on their perspectives many of these social science studies have been useful in identifying variations in communication from group to group and specifying psychological and sociological variables in the communication process however this approach is limited first and foremost is human communication is often more creative than predictable and that reality is not just external but is also internally constructed so there's these are two big ideas first of all um, science the hard sciences are interested in examining things that are external to the human him or herself right so um, humans are a different kind of phenomenon than that external reality right because we identify ourselves in a from a scientific perspective as unique animals in the world um, and studying human behavior through psychology or sociology is therefore more complex and um, oftentimes less predictable than other kinds of physical phenomena that scientists observe for example in biology or in chemistry or in physics and this idea that reality is not just external but is also internally constructed is this recognition that there are of course these worldviews these perceptions that change the way we understand external reality okay um, and so this is that idea that hard sciences has to deal with um, and that is that if there is a single external phenomenon we should all in, in and, and there were, was no perception involved we should all understand that phenomenon in the same way however that's not the case right so the idea is to try to understand how your perception uh, influences your understanding of external phenomena because there is that part that is interpretive because it's internally constructed
right? We can only observe through our eyes, through our own experience, all these things. Um, second, people cannot identify all the variables that affect their communication, right? Uh, communication involves a lot of different variables and you can't uh, effectively put people into laboratory situations where you really limit those variables like you might with a scientific uh, trial. Scholars also recognize that some methods in this approach are not culturally sensitive and that researchers may be too distant from the phenomena or people they are researching. Right? And this is um, the challenge of the scientific approach is that it is intentionally uh, excluding culture, historically, like as a hard science, excluding culture from the study that's supposed to be objectivist. Um, so in that way, sometimes they can objectify their subjects. So we're studying humans that can be seen as culturally um, insensitive, right? And that when you ob try to make yourself objective, sometimes you can overlook or misconstrue uh, human behavior, which is oftentimes, maybe more often than not, um, subjective rather than objective. But there are ways that these uh, kinds of researchers overcome these challenges. Uh, and those are methods that have to do with making sure that our measures are um, reliable and verifiable, okay? So some of those things might be collecting a large enough pool um, of data from enough subjects to be representative of a larger group and using statistical measures to test the validity of that of those collected data okay so here's some examples a couple of studies to show you how they might work so one study tried to find whether muslim migrants use of facebook affected their cultural adaptation to the united states predicting that immigrants use of facebook to, to communicate with other immigrants would impact their rate of adaptation to the united states and their perceptions of america they discovered that over time, these immigrants used Facebook mostly to interact with other Muslims and were also less likely to culturally adapt to the U.S. culture and more likely to have a negative perception of the U.S. They suggest that one reason for this outcome is a negative political and social situation in the U.S. and the war on terror where Muslims have been the center of attention. All right, so the, the idea here that they're trying to figure out is uh, would Facebook impact this particular group of Muslim migrants adaptation to the United States and they found that it did okay um, that Facebook allowed them to connect and communicate with other Muslims elsewhere and therefore gave them uh, a community right that maybe stood in place of if they had to adapt without some external technology um, and they had to adapt in that location um, where they were living in the U.S., right? And that's complicated then by the fact that they probably were also getting social messages about U.S. perception of Muslims, right? And how that kind of isolated them or excluded them from um, participating or adapting fully into U.S. culture. And another uh, similar social science study found slightly different results in that study, they measured Asian and European immigrants' use of social media and email to communicate with people of their own country and also Americans, right? Um, they also measured immigrants' face-to-face -face contacts with the same groups. Based on this integrative theory of adaptation, they predicted and later found that the more migrants communicated with people in the U.S., both face-to-face -face and on social media, the better adapted they were to U.S. culture and the less likely they communicated with friends and family back home. Um, in other words that actually interacting with the people where you migrate will help those migrants better adapt to their new living situation and make them less dependent um, on their previous uh, living situation, right? Um, so in some ways, it's a slightly different result, but it's a slightly different study, right? So um, none of these studies are intended to answer this huge, big question. Instead, like other kinds of science, they incrementally work so that together they start to build a picture, a description of what's out there and allow us hopefully to make predictions based on this incremental growth in knowledge. Uh, another group of social science researchers predicted the immigrants degree of acculturation in the United States 
might influence their perceptions of racial discrimination and their need for social support, right? So it's another kind of thing you might try to study, right? Well, you'll notice that these are all about intercultural contact, what happens when these two cultures come together. Uh, there are lots of theories that grow from this perspective. So if you um, studied science, if you study science now or you studied science as a younger person, you'll remember that science is built around hypotheses, that is what we think is going to happen and what we reasonably think is going to happen, that we then test to see if they're true. And those hypotheses, when they are um, proven in certain ways through different studies, become theories that then can be further tested uh, in both uh, in, in nuanced ways, right? So these are intercultural interaction theories. William um, Guttekunst, proposed the anxiety uncertainty man management theory, which explains the role of anxiety and uncertainty in individuals communicating with host culture members when they enter a new culture. Right? You can imagine we all have experienced some form or level of anxiety uh, when we meet people of a new culture. This theory predicts certain optimal levels of uncertainty and anxiety and how they motivate individuals to engage in successful interaction. Right. So trying to uh, identify where is the level where it's you're uncertain and anxious enough, but still comfortable enough uh, to engage, right? So maybe that, that anxiety causes some kind of curiosity, right? Like encourages engagement and not so anxious and uncertain that you are um, maybe too frightened to engage, right? A related social science program, Estella Ting Toomey's face negotiation theory. This is a really uh, significant theory if you are studying from a linguistic perspective. And that is face is the sense of favorable self-worth. And in all, in all cultures, people are concerned about saving face. So we've heard that expression, he's just trying to save face, right? He's trying to preserve uh, his own feeling of self-worth, his own value in the situation. Ting Tumi suggests that conflict is a face negotiation process in which people often have their face threatened or questioned. In other words, uh, when people of different groups and in fact, people even in the same group, when they when they interact, they are negotiating um, their own kind of self worth and their value to each other in that in that moment. Um, so, in contrast to the AUM conversational constraints theory developed by Min Soon Kim, attempts to explain how and why people make particular conversational choices, suggesting five universal conversational constraints or concerns: clarity, right? Is it clear? Minimizing imposition, not trying to impose on other people. Consideration for others' feelings, not trying to hurt other people. Risking ne negative evaluation by the hearer, that is not, not uh, risking your own, your face or your own value, right? Um, and effectiveness, right? Getting the job done. The communication accommodation theory is the result of another social science program in which researchers attempted to identify how and when Individuals accommodated their speech and nonverbal behavior to others during an interaction. In other words, how do people accommodate their own behavior to for successful interaction with new hearers? So unlike the AUM and the conversational constraints theory, communication accommodation theory focused on adaptation during intercultural interaction, right? Not basically like how we feel going into it and how that impacts our communication or how we use different kind of um, ideas about how to best communicate in order to do it, but how do we actually continue to adapt while we interact with people? Uh, another interesting one, the diffusion of inter innovations theory developed by communication scholar Everett Rogers explains how cultural practices can be changed largely due to communication. The theory explains why some innovations like computer technology or the internet or certain behaviors like safe sex are accepted by some people and rejected by others. The theory posits that for people to accept a new technology or a new idea, they must see the usefulness of it and it must be compatible with their values and lifestyle. In other words, um, people will only care about new things if they find them related, related to themselves and, and if they find them um, compatible, they fit in what, what they think the world should do or be. Right. And so they say that's a good tool or technology or idea or behavior for me to adopt because it fits within what I already think I should be doing. Um, the second approach is the interpretive approach. The interpretive approach will be familiar with to some of you. Um, one interpretive approach written in sociolinguistics is ethnography of communication. 
if you've taken a folklore class, you might be familiar with ethnography. Um, ethnographers of communication, though, are devoted to descriptive studies of communication patterns within specific cultural groups. So an ethnographer is a person who goes and lives within a community and attempts to describe what they do. Um, in folklore, that would be to describe their practices um, and their, their cultural elements. Ethnographers of communication are more interested in their language and their nonverbal communication and how they interact with one another. Um, inter interpretive research is assumed not only that reality is external to humans, but also that humans construct reality. So um, most of these researchers will believe that there is, yes, an external world that is uh, separate from human experience, right? Uh, but also that humans can construct their own reality. That is that ideas um, have meaning and impact our understanding of the world around us. They believe that human experience, including communication, is subjective and human behavior is neither predetermined nor easily predicted. In other words, they do a, take a very different approach than the social science position. The goal of interpretive research is to understand and describe human behavior. We're not trying to predict behavior here. Whereas the social scientist tends to see communication as influenced by culture, the interpretivist sees culture as created and maintained through communication. In other words, our reality is constantly filtered through our language. And the way we understand the world is, is largely linguistic. Um, that is, if, it, if you can't name it and describe it, it doesn't really, I mean, it might exist, but we don't understand it or think about it or communicate about it. And then communicating about it, then we build our culture, right? Which are those values added on to how we understand the world. This type of research uses qualitative methods derived from anthropology and linguistics, um, such as field studies, observations, and participant observations. So a lot of actual talking to people, kind of interviewing those ideas. For example, a research engaged in participant observation contributes actively to the communication process being observed and studied. The researcher is thus intimately involved in the research and may become good friends with members of the communities he or she is studying. For, um, some of these might be like in a workplace, you could study the communication of the workplace in which you already work and know those people because you're intimately involved and have access to observe um, at a granular level and a personal level how that communication happens or maybe in a social group of some kind, right? Um, another example of interpretive research is the rhetorical approach. Uh, also used by critical researchers, which we'll talk about next, perhaps the oldest communication scholarship dating back to the ancient Greeks. Rhetoricians typically examine and analyze texts or public speeches in the context in which they incur. Cross-cultural psychologists use the term etic and emic to um, distinguish social sciences versus the interpretive approaches. So social science researchers usually search for universal generalizations and study cultures objectively with an outsider's view. And this way is etic, okay? In contrast, interpretive uh, re research usually focuses on understanding phenomena subjectively from within a particular cultural community or context. In this way, it's emic, okay? Here's some examples. So here's communication experiences of immigrants. So one example, Rodriguez and Dawkins interviewed unaccompanied, undocumented Latino youth in Texas and found that the youth were more, mo much more often victims of crimes um, than they were perpetrators of crime. In addition, one primary deterrent to crime and delinquency was the meaningful relationships they developed with schoolmates and family members, right? So uh, through those interviews, they were able to determine that this uh, communication with schoolmates and family members had a positive impact um, on these people who were experiencing much more crime than they were part of. A similar study involved focus groups. So focus groups are when you get a group of people together and do kind of group uh, surveys and discussions. In this study, researchers asked young immigrants from Ethiopia living in Israel about their experiences and specifically what communication strategies they used to adapt to live there. These young men and women described differences between Ethiopian and Israeli cultural values and communication preferences. They described their home values as a strong emphasis on respect for elders and parents and the total loyalty one has for a friend. They also contrasted strong emphasis on gentleness and reservedness in Ethiopian relationships with the more assertiveness and directness preferred by Israelis. They described how this, they sometimes emphasize cultural commonalities and sometimes 
differences in their interactions in the foreign country depending on the context, right? So uh, through this study, through these uh, discussions with discussion groups, with focus groups, they're able to describe some of those differences and similarities between the communication preferences and styles of and cultures of Ethiopian uh, people and how those Ethiopian people experienced Israeli culture. So one can observe that immigrants in both studies describe some ambivalence and contradictory feelings in their adaptation experience. On the one hand, recognizing and even embracing their own unique cultural background and values, and at the same time, trying out the new values and communication patterns. Right? They're, they're both tied to their, their home cultures and adapting to the new culture, and it creates ambivalence or contradictory feelings about that. The interpretive approach, um, here are some examples of how we think about cultural communication patterns. So a number of interpretive scholars are have emphasized that descriptions of communication rules of a given people must be grounded or centered in their beliefs and values. In other words, uh, how we communicate is driven by our worldview, right? Most scholarly studies of communication are rooted in a European American perspective, as you would expect, because they were developed um, in a Western tradition, academic tradition, okay? Um, and this frame of reference, though, is not necessarily applicable to communication of all cultural groups, and maybe it's not the most useful way to think about how we study the communication of different cultures, right? So, for example, Malifi Asante um, developed a framework of Afrocentricity to apply to studies about African or African-American communication. He identifies five cultural themes shared by peoples of African descent, so not just people in Africa, not just African-Americans, but also Afro-Caribbeans and other uh, diaspora of African peoples around the world. So a common origin and experience of struggle, an element of resistance to European legal procedures, medical pr practices, and political processes, traditional values of humanness or humaneness in harmony with nature, a fundamentally African way of knowing and interpreting the world, and an orientation towards communalism. So uh, you will recognize in that communalism, for example, as opposed to what we talked about earlier with individualism of American culture. Um, but this notion that, of course, culture in our own worldviews uh, defines the ways in which we communicate. And so when we study those, we need to be aware of those differences and be culturally aware of how we interpret these communication practices. Similarly, Asian scholars have developed Asia-centric frameworks to study the communication of people from Asian cultures. Communication scholar Yoshitaka Miike has identified five Asia-centric themes, circularity, harmony, other directedness, reciprocity, and relationality. Um, based on these themes, he developed five propositions on human communication. Communication is a process in which people remind themselves of the inter interdependence and interrelatedness of the universe. So this is the idea of interconnectedness, which might be very different than an individualistic perspective. People reduce their selfishness and, and egocentrism. People feel the joy and suffering of all beings. People receive and return their debts to all beings. People moralize and harmonize the universe. We can see how these are very um, culturally driven through Asian cultures in a way that uh, American culture might come up with you know, five very different propositions on human communication based on kind of American cultures. Another important interpretive theory, a communication theory of identity, was developed by Michael Hecht. He argues that communication is a communicative process and people's identities emerge in relationships with others and are expressed in core symbols, meanings, and labels. In other words, our communication is not just driven by our culture, but is developed through this recursive activity of continually communicating with people within our own culture. And that's how we um, develop our culture, right? So culture is both impacting communication and communication is building culture, right? It's a reciprocal relationship. The utility of the interpretivist approach is that it provides an in-depth understanding of communication patterns in particular communities because it emphasizes investigating communication in context. The main limitation of the approach is that there are, a f that there are few interpretive studies of actual intercultural communication, that is, um, how that contact actually happens and how 
both sides uh, participate, right? Interminative scholars typically have not studied what happens when the two groups encounter each other. What they're interested in is maybe a one group's understanding of that experience, okay? Um, and, and living in a different culture. A second limitation is that researchers often are outsiders to communities under investigation, which means they may not represent accurately the communication patterns of the members of that community. And you can think about how, if you think about the member, the communities that you're part of, that when you're an insider, you have uh, shared language and shared jokes and shared patterns of communication um, that external observers may not get. Not because you're intentionally excluding them, but because you have built this um, community and culture through which you're able to uh, communicate in very internal ways. Uh, the third approach is the critical approach. And the critical approach is um, focused also on the subjective rather than the objective and material reality. They also emphasize the importance of studying the context in which communication occurs, that is the situation, background, or environment. In this way, it's similar to the interpretive approach. However, critical researchers usually focus on macro contexts, such as the political and social structures that influence communication. Critical scholars, unlike most social scientists and interpretivists, are interested in the historical context of communications. We'll talk a lot about history. Critical scholars are interested in the power relations in communication. For them, identifying cultural difference in communication is important only in relation to power differentials. Culture is, in essence, a battleground, a place where multiple interpretations come together, but a dominant force always prevails. And so we'll talk about the relationship between majority cultures and minority cultures and how that impacts their ability to effectively communicate with one another. The goal of the critical research is not to understand human behavior, not only to understand human behavior, but also to actually change the lives of everyday communicators. Researchers assume that by examining and reporting how power functions in culture situations, they can help the average person learn how to resist forces of power and oppression. So like interpretive scholars, critical scholars also use interviews, focus groups, and rhetorical methods in analyzing encounters between immigrants and host groups. They also use textual analyses. That is, they analyze the cultural products, such as media, as powerful voices in shaping contemporary culture. Um, Here's some examples. So one critical study used form, informal conversational face-to-face -face interviews to understand the larger societal context of one group of immigrants, Montagnards, who settled in North Carolina. The Montagnards come from the central highlands of Vietnam and fought with the United States against the Vietnamese government in the 1960s. After the war ended, they were persecuted for help in the U.S. and fled and settled in the U.S. In the study, this um, communication scholar... Etsuko Kinefuchi asked a group of Montagnard men to talk about their experience in coming to the U.S. and discuss what place they see as their home and why. In analyzing the data, she found that many of the men still thought of Vietnam as home and had strong emotional attachment to the people there and their indigenous land. Unlike social scientists who focused, who would, might focus on the immigrants' experience and initiative in adapting to a host culture, critical scholars focus on the structural limitations that prevent the Montagnards from having satisfying interpersonal encounters with Americans. So they're not focused on, on um, the groups or on the individuals, but instead what barriers are actually there in society, in culture, that isolate particular groups of immigrants from the majority culture. A similar study analyzed stories of domestic um, foreign domestic helpers in Hong Kong who recounted their intercultural encounters with host culture members, the Hong Kongese. The Hong Kongese report enormous challenges of their immigrant situation. They are paid extremely low wages, have very few legal protection and rights, and are often exploited and even abused by their employees. Right. So you'll see how what, what the critical approach focuses on is this disparity between the haves and the have-nots, between the powerful and the powerless and how um, the majority culture might use communication to um, disempower minority cultures and then ultimately, like in this case, take advantage of that power structure.
Taken together, these various viewpoints emphasize how different migrant groups experience cultural adaptation in a new country and their encounters with host members there. Thinking about migrant groups and adaptation, the critical perspective emphasizes the economic, political, and cultural differences among these groups in understanding their experiences and the reception by host members in the new culture. An important critical perspective is the idea of post-colonialism, an intellectual, political, and cultural movement that calls for the independence of colonized states and liberation from colonialist mentality or ways of thinking. So, um, so post-colonialism, if you think about colonialism, are the powerful countries who, who go to other areas of the world and colonize, that is, set up societies and cultures in which their um, societies and countries in which their culture is the dominant, and they force the people there to uh, adhere to new cultural norms. Um, so we have gone through a period of decolonization, right, where places like the United States decolonized from Britain, but more significantly, perhaps in places like India and Pakistan, uh, right, in, in all the East there, uh, and across Africa and South America have decolonialized. So what do you do post-colonial? We found some of these cultures um, continuing the ways of living they had learned under European control um, because that is what now for generations has been the norm, right? So how do we decolonialize our minds as well, right? So post-colonialism, not simply a study of colonialism, but the study of how people might deal with the past of colonialism and its aftermath, um, which may include the ongoing use of colonial language, culture, and religion. So when you go to a, a country in Africa and their language is French or English or South America and they're speaking Portuguese and Spanish or English, um, or you end up in the Philippines, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, where there is a mix of colonial um, powers there. So how do these countries, how are these countries dealing with and growing out of and into this new context in the post-colonial era? For example, language specialist Garvita um, investigated how Filipinos, Filipinos negotiate their post-colonial identity through a particular type of language use. Konyo talk in online discussions. Konyo talk is a hybrid of colonizer and indigenous languages that's used by many Filipinos to affirm their existence and demonstrate their own power, often to criticize their coloners. This ability to switch between languages clearly shows the speakers multiple and complementary hybrid identities, that is, their mixed identities, right? Not only Filipino, but the longtime Hispanic colonizers and Anglophone, Anglophone or English speaking colonizers. Um, co-created online where other Konyo speakers can understand them. Hybrid identities are emerging in many regions. The use of Kiswahili as a regional language in East Africa is one example. Kenya, Uganda, and, T and Tanzania, formerly British colonies, are looking for greater cooperation. As they were earlier known as East African co Cooperation, the former colonies have a colonial past that they are using to forge a new post-colonial entity. Kiswahili has emerged as a language on which this new integration has occurred rather than English, right? So um, finding a new uh, language through which they can communicate about their own culture that is inclusive of their past in the pre-colonial times and looking forward to a post-colonial uh, world. A final example of a critical study is Moon's investigation of gender and social class communication in the U.S., so I think this is an important example because we're not just talking about between different countries. We're actually talking also about other of these uh, identity markers, right? So in her study, Moon analyzed interviews of white women from working class backgrounds. Subtle communication practices that reinforce social class differences are not so invisible to women from working class backgrounds. In other words, they were able to observe them. Moon shows how culture, social class, and communication work together to reproduce the contemporary social structure. She also identifies some strategies used by these women to resist this process of social reproduction. In other words, um, how we can get caught in the cycle of reproducing our current status quo that maintains the status quo across um, throughout a, a society or a culture over time, um, and how critical approaches are interested in that, that 
ability to resist. The critical approach emphasizes power relations and intercultural inter interactions and the importance of social and historical contexts. One limitation that is most well, one limitation that is that most critical studies do not focus on face-to-face -face intercultural interaction. Also, this approach does not allow for much empirical data. It's very um, subjective. So what are we doing in this class? We're adopting a dialectical approach to understanding culture and communication by combining the three traditional paradigms and what the book calls the dialectical approach. Dialectical meaning two, which means we're going to set up um, binary oppositions across that create, um, you can imagine kind of a, a scale, right, between these two ideas. So there are many different ways to approach the study of intercultural communication. The social science interpretive and critical approaches operate in interconnected and sometimes contradictory ways. Rather than advocating any one approach, it is advisable to follow a dialectical approach to intercultural communication research and practice. The dialogical approach emphasizes the processual, relational, and contradictory nature of the intercultural communication, which encompasses many different kinds of knowledge. First, with regard with the processual um, nature of intercultural communication, it's important to remember that cultures change as do individuals, right? So even though we can define uh, and describe communication in one moment, uh, we have to also recognize that that is not always true of everyone in all times, right? Second, a dialectical perspective emphasizes a relational aspect of intercultural communication studies, um, that how things and people relate to one another in the situation. And third, a characteristic of a dialectical perspective involves holding contradictory ideas simultaneously. That is, we can both, um, like our immigrant stories, hold on to our past selves while adapting to a new self um, which seem to be very contradictory, but can coexist, right? Research findings can make, make a difference in the everyday world. From the social science perspective, people can see how specific communication and cultural differences might create differing worldviews, which it can help them predict, predict intercultural conflicts. An interpretive investigation gives people an opportunity to confirm what they predicted in a hypothetical social science study. A critical approach might focus on the different access to economic, political, and material resources among the cultural groups, such as which cultural groups were or were not welcomed and how these power differentials influenced their intercultural experiences. Thinking dialectically forces people to move beyond their familiar categories and introduces them to new possibilities for studying and understanding intercultural communication. So here are six dialectics of intercultural communication. The cultural individual dialectic. Indi intercultural communication is both cultural and individual or idiosyncratic. That is, communication is cultural means that people share communication patterns with members of the groups to which they belong. And the fact that it is individual means that it is also in idiosyncratic or specific to that individual, right? So while within a particular group, we can find lots of commonalities. We can also find things that are individualistic, and that's okay, right? It's not one or the other. It's a both and. Personal and contextual dialect. This dialectic involves the role of context in intercultural relationships and focuses on simultaneously on the person and on the context. Although people communicate as individuals on a personal level, the context of the communication is important as well, right? So this... Um, this makes sense, I think, that, that we can both consider what is the individual uh, relationship between those people and their contextual situation through, during which they're communicating, right? Differences and similarities dialectic. Intercultural communication is characterized by both similarities and differences in that people are simultaneously similar to and different from each other. Emphasizing only differences can lead to stereotyping and prejudice. Emphasizing only similarities can lead to people uh, ignoring the importance of cultural variations that we know exist. All right, so being aware all the time that there are both similarities and differences in communication. Static dynamic dialectic. This dialectic suggests that intercultural communication tends to be at once static and dynamic. Some cultural communication patterns remain relatively constant. Whereas other aspects of cultures or personal traits of individuals shift over time. That is, they are dynamic, right? So um, there are aspects of communication and how we communicate that are the same 
right, over time. Perhaps our purposes for communication is one good example of that. Um, but lots of aspects will change over time, right? Uh, including ourselves as people, right? Our own in, in personality traits and our own identities, right? And so being aware that just because we can identify some things that seem to be static doesn't mean that everything has to be static. Or just because we see some elements of communication shifting, for, ex for example, in relationship to a new technology, doesn't mean that we've thrown everything that we know about communication out the window. History past and present future dialectic. This dialectic emphasizes the need to focus simultaneously on the past and the present in understanding intercultural communication. That is, the communication we're looking at may be present or may be something we're uh, thinking about is going to happen in the future, right? What's going to happen. But what we know about this relationship and about all the communication practices of the past and the power structure of the past, the history that comes along with any two cultures meeting is significant. So we have to be aware of the importance of history, but also the context, the moment in which uh, the communication is happening, right? Privilege and disadvantage dialectic recognizes that people may be simultaneously privileged and disadvantaged. That is, privileged in some contexts and disadvantaged in others, right? So um, people may be members of their majority culture in many ways, except for one or two, and in that way they are disadvantaged. Or people may in some contexts where their minor minority culture is a majority culture uh, be advantaged and privileged, and then when in contact with a majority culture be disadvantaged, right, in another. So being aware of these dialectics can help us take a broader view of intercultural communication. So a dialectical approach to understanding culture and communication um, takes two big ideas. So dialog dialogical approach is not a specific theory to all aspects of intercultural communication. Rather, it is a lens through which to view the complexities of the topic, right? It's just a way to help us look at and think about intercult intercultural communication as we're studying it. Second, the, dia dialogical appro the dialectical approach <coughs> that is taken in the book combines the three traditional approaches and suggests four components to consider and understanding intercultural communication, culture, communication, context, and power. Culture and communication are obviously the foreground. Those are the things where, that we can observe directly and context and power are the backdrop against which people can understand intercultural communication. That is how people interact. I know these are a lot of big ideas. It's just setting the stage where we're going to be studying this this uh, session over the summer. So please, if you have any questions, let me know. I'm here to help.